All right. What is up, ladies and gentlemen? We are back with yet another Next Tiva webinar. And we have a phenomenal guest uh, for you today. Uh, his name is Daniel Barber, and he is the CEO of Data Grail. Um, we just wanted to uh, welcome you to the webinar. We're about to kick off in just a few minutes, uh, probably a minute or so. But I noticed we had a couple of uh, people in the sidebar here. Uh, so Zev, what is up, man? Thank you for being a Next Tiva fan. Hopefully after this webinar, you'll also be a Data Grail fan. Uh, Daniel Barber is a good friend of mine, also one of the most brilliant minds when it comes to data privacy, customer data, and just flat out scaling and growing companies. Um, and Brandon uh, Boldrini, what is up, man? Thank you again for, for joining the next Tiva webinar. Um, so I want to just tell you guys a couple of quick household items quick before we uh, get into this. So um, if you got to drop off at any point, it's all good. You're going to get a, a follow-up with the webinar recording. No big deal there. If um, you are going through this webinar with us and you're, you're, you know, you really want to just, you know, connect with Daniel and learn more about this stuff, there's a custom uh, call to action button that says connect with Daniel. It'll point you right to his LinkedIn and you can connect with him there if you'd like. Uh, I would highly recommend that you all do that. Uh, we're also going to be doing a poll at some point throughout this webinar. So once we do that, um, you're going to see the poll pop up and we're going to ask you to just kind of complete it uh, when the time is right. And then if you have any questions to ask, you can use the ask a question button down in, uh, on the uh, toolbar below, or you can just pop a question into the side chat bar. That's cool too. Or if you just want to chat and just say anything you want, commentary as, as the webinar is going down, you can do that as well. Um, and then at the end, we're going to do some Q&A. Now, the cool thing about the Q&A is that we can actually invite you onto the webinar with your screen, with your with your audio. You can talk to us in real time, which is was pretty damn cool. I got to say, shout out to Crowdcast uh, for, for kind of mastering the, the user experience of this webinar tool. It's, it's completely, uh, I would say, a cut above the rest of them. I've used a lot of them before, and Crowdcast is pretty, pretty sweet. So, um, yeah, with that being said, uh, it looks like we're going to dive right in. We've got about uh, 60 or so people registered for this event, about 15 live right now. So uh, without further delay, I think I'm going to share my screen and we're going to get this thing started. So let's uh, let's kick this thing off here. So I'm just going to go uh, into screen share mode and uh, pass it over to Daniel to do some introductions on himself. So he's going to tell you a little bit about uh, what you're going to learn today, what Data Grail itself is all about, and uh, we're just going to get right into this. So I'm going to focus my, my screen here um, on the presentation deck, and I'm going to highlight this and go into full screen presentation mode. And Daniel, let me know if we're looking good. Yeah, it looks great. All right, cool. everybody can see the, the presentation deck nice and clear. You can see our faces talking, our beautiful faces, and uh, we're going to just dive right into this. <laughs> so um, quick overview, you're going to learn a little bit about Data Grail. Um, you'll learn a little bit about Nextiva as well. You'll learn how to use customer data to increase your revenue, how to stay compliant with privacy regulations like GDPR, the California Act that recently got passed, the um, also, how to acquire and, and organize customer data across your, your IT and technology systems, and then we'll recap it with a nice uh, Q&A session. Hopefully, we get some nice dialogue going there. So um, without further delay, uh, I'd like to welcome you and, and, and introduce Daniel Barber. Daniel, if you want to take it away, just kind of tell the audience a little bit about your background, what Data Grail is, what do you guys actually do, um, and then we'll dive into the, uh, the fun stuff. So Daniel, please take it away, brother. Sure. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, yeah, Jason, I'm really, uh, really excited to uh, uh, do the session with you today. Um, you know, it's been great, great working together over the last couple of years. And, um, you know, today I, I'm excited to um, share a little bit about, yeah, what, what Data Grail is doing, but more around, um, you know, how, um, how we're seeing some sort of trends related to privacy and how you can use customer data. Um, a little bit about myself. Um, you know, I've been fortunate to work for some great companies. Um, I worked at a company called Responsus, um, and after that, you can see mm -hmm. Cloud App and Data Nice. Um, and what we saw 
um, you know, you see a lot of companies using a bunch of different systems across their organization. Um, each one of those mm-hmm. companies and those systems uh, themselves are applications. And so, um, you know, personal data has uh, extended uh, beyond just the internal systems that may be operating your technology or product or service itself. Um, and then I'm fortunate to, uh, to advise uh, a few other technology products as well. So I advise a company called Outreach.io, which acquired Sales Hacker um, last year, uh, which is where Jaitano and I were uh, fortunate to meet. And uh, then a company <laughs> called Chorus.ai um, and a construction technology company in Australia. So I am Australian. Um, I, I, I try to support my, my uh, company men when I can. Um, <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, then was, uh, you know, fortunate again to meet um, two amazing co-founders, Earl and Ignacio. And uh, we collectively co-founded DataGrail in, in February of last year. Um, so focused on privacy specifically, um, retrieval, deletion, preference management of the, the, the data that is used across your organization. Um, and specifically, we, we generally work with IT teams, security teams, legal counsel, mm-hmm. um, sometimes marketing teams as well who are trying to, you know, trying to ensure they are ready for these regulatory frameworks. Um, we've, yep. you know, we've had some great customers come on board, um, a few of which are named down below there. Um, and, uh, yeah, excited to share a few insights from what we've seen both from customers and my previous experience running revenue teams for the last decade. Oh, that's awesome, man. And for, for the audience that, uh, you may not know this, but, um, when I was running digital marketing at sales hacker, uh, my past company, which was acquired by outreach, Daniel helped us get fully compliant and on board and, and prepared for GDPR, which, uh, you know, I'll just put it to you like this. It was, it was a nightmare. Uh, without Daniel. And then once Daniel came on board and helped us, it's like, ah, okay, now there's clarity to this. We know exactly the right steps to take. We were kind of scrambling before all that happened. So uh, Daniel, thanks again for helping us get GDPR compliant last year. That was uh, really helpful and an awesome experience uh, learning from you and and working with you during that time. So um, (laughs) thanks again for that, man. Yep. Yeah, thank you so much. So let's get into uh, some of the good stuff here. We're going to talk about how to use customer data to increase your revenue. So Daniel, maybe you uh, can take it away from here, how to target your ideal customer. Yeah, so you know the the interesting thing when you've collected um, customer data, and we probably remember back in 2015, and if, if you didn't um, uh, get a chance to read these, there's a few blog posts here that are shared that some of them are, are co-written, some of them I wrote myself. Um, you know, they're... This this period, um, this concept of like defining your ideal customer profile, and if you haven't um, read anything from Lincoln Murphy, so he sort of coined this mm-hmm. term. That was his term, um, and I, I took it, um, you know, sort of to the sales development uh, field. Um, and I think what was interesting at that stage is, you know, the GDPR actually didn't exist then. Um, data pre- uh, privacy regulation did exist, but um, there was there was no real oversight from a um, regulatory framework standpoint, um, and so you know it was very easy to just mine company data, mine personal data, and compile it all together. Um, so what's changed? <laughs> so, so, you're, so, so you're saying that salespeople could go nuts; they could scrape data yeah, and abuse yeah. lists and um, share lists and all that kind of crap. Exactly. That's a that's a pretty yeah. good summary. Um, And I think now, um, you know, we've entered this age of privacy, right? Where fundamentally, um, it doesn't mean business has to shut down. It just means you have to be a bit more transparent with how you're operating your business and how you're um, emailing people and how you're collecting their consent and how you're providing, um, you know, transparency and control to to your customer or to your user. Um, So if we go to the the next one there, you'll see... um, you know, Eric Rees, if you haven't read The Lean Startup, um, I mean, look, his statement there is about as simple as it gets, but um, you will attract uh, more customers if you understand the current customers you have. Um, there are some, uh, you know, sort of structural things you can look at in your ideal customer profile. Um, and I presented this um, in New York, actually, back in 2016. Um, but mm-hmm. the same thing holds, meaning... You know, you want to look at the industry or the company, uh, sorry, the vertical within that industry that, uh, right. you know, your, your customer, right? Um, if they're a private company, perhaps their funding amount, 
um, or the market cap if they're publicly traded, the geography, so the location of the company, the role of the individual that you're selling to, the number of employees. These are all factors um, and variables into building out your ideal customer profile. Um, and there are a number of data sources um, that you can use to do that. Um, so if you click over to the right there, um, Jay Tano, you, you know, there, these are commonly known data sources. Um, there's been some consolidation in those data sources. So we've seen, um, you know, companies like DataFox, they were acquired by uh, Oracle um, last year mm -hmm. and you saw, um, you know, Zoom Info acquire my former company, um, DataNice. Um, and then yep. similarly with, Discover Org acquiring Zoom Info. This is happening because um, you know the the data space in general, selling data as a product, especially um, firmographic data. Um, there were probably too many players in that space, to be honest. Selling um, the same it's way too crowded. Yeah, selling the same kind of thing, yeah. right? So yeah. it makes sense for this consolidation, and there are clearly yeah. some now front runners. Um, uh, and I just mm -hmm. list a few of them there, uh, but there are other ones yeah. as well. Yeah, I can't tell you how many times uh, a week I get hit up by one of these players, you know, Crunchbase, Zoom Info, Clearbit. Yep. They're all knocking at my door trying to get me to buy their data. <laughs> yep. yep. So, it's, yeah. Um, yep. But, you know, what you want to look at is use those data sources to map against those variables on the left-hand side. Um, and the blog right. posts that right. were shared on the prior slide will help you sort of think about that process around the ideal customer profile. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, a quick use case for the audience, like, here's a great example. At Sales Hacker, we built our email list up to about 100 and, 100 and something thousand subscribers, so over yep. 100K. And we only had actionable data, I would say around 40, 40 to 50% of that database was appended to those points that Daniel has here on that left hand column. So for example, we didn't know industry and vertical for about half of our database. We didn't know geography. We didn't know roles, job titles, number of employees, all those sorts of things. You can do sort of these batch enrich type of uh, exactly. activities with databases like Clearbit. You can use an API, run your database through it. And then voila, at the end, the, the hope is that the hope is that you'll have um, you know close to 100% match rate. Of course, you never do have 100% match rate, but you can get up to like 70 to 80% of your database um, enriched and appended to all these sources. Um, but you pay a hefty, a hefty price for it. You pay a pretty penny, and yep. uh, you know I'll just tell you they beat you over the head. But that's you know that's because they are the data aggregators. So yep. data costs money these days. Yep. No. Spot on. Um, yep. And that example is yep. really good. So. You know, I think in terms of the, what does it look like in 2019? It's a little bit different, right? And it's also mm -hmm. improved in some areas. So before we go mm -hmm. into the, the privacy regulations themselves, um, it's important to understand that firmographic data, so data about a business that has no connection to an individual, meaning um, if you're trying to understand the businesses that you could sell to, so firmographic information, that is protected, meaning, um, you know, it, the, the the design of these privacy regulations is set up to protect individuals. Um, and right. so those individuals could be working at a business or they could be consumers. So it applies to both. But um, the actual information about one's business, that's irrelevant from a, a privacy standpoint. Um, and so therefore, um, there's a couple things you can do there in 2019 that are very different than 2015. Um, so give a couple, I'll, I'll give a couple of examples here, but um, as you click through these, um, you know, you can, you can now get information uh, on whether someone's actually interested in your potential service, right? Mm -hmm. So um, things like intent data, um, you know, providers like Bombora, G2 Crowd, and there are others, they will sell data about people that are looking, companies that are looking mm -hmm. for your product or service. Now, yeah. Um, so, so, Daniel, how, do, how does that all how does that all work? I know <clears throat> it's kind of a nebulous concept, you know, intent yep. data. Yeah. But like how is Bombora capturing people that are you know searching for that product or expressing intent? Like, are they monitoring uh, keyword hashtags on social media? Like, are they, like how does it all work? What's the science behind it? Because I'm yeah. even myself, I wonder sometimes how, like, how does yeah. it work. It's um so there's a bunch of things. Um, you know, some yeah. of it is uh, job postings, right? So when people 
mm-hmm. um, post job postings and and technologies or services or, or words are included in those job postings. Some of it is a bit more a uh, bit more technical. So they are looking at search terms and looking at how many people are searching for particular categories of technology. Um, right. They it's unlikely that one could uh, decipher who at a company is actually searching, but they can give you companies right. that are searching. Right, so they can tell right. you these right. companies are looking for your category of product or service. Um, so, at mm-hmm. this point in 2019, you should absolutely be buying that data. You would be silly not to, um, because right. uh, you can then use it in a in a whole host of interesting ways. So, the first one is um, if you use that information, um, you can now uh, you know find the individuals based on the data bases prior, right? You could go to Zoom Info, you could go to Discover Org, or you could go to Clearbit and say, look, I want to know all of the people at this company um, and the company being mm-hmm. the one that's potentially looking for your product or service and get that contact information. Um, and right. contacting them um, is actually a feasible activity. And we'll talk about what mm-hmm. that means from a GDPR perspective because there are some things that you need to express when you contact them in this type of manner. Mm-hmm. But um, mm-hmm. yeah, you're, you're able to contact them. You just have to be explicit about how you found their information and why you're contacting them because it is cold outreach, which um, hey. uh, you know you need to disclose. And we'll talk about what disclosure statements mean in some upcoming slides right. here, but um, you should yeah. absolutely be doing that. In 2019, if you're not looking at intent data, you're gonna get left behind. Um, and then the other thing I would say that is is a no brainer is looking at the people that are visiting your website. So the customers mm-hmm. or prospects, mm-hmm. um, you know, Clearbit partnered with Drift, you can see the visitors on your website, the domains, the companies that are visiting your website. If you're not using that type of data today in 2019, you absolutely should be. Um, I would book a right. demo with with Drift or another provider that is um, doing that type of service. Um, there are lots of them. Um, but the domain or the company that's coming to your website and visiting your website, you should know who those are. Um, Absolutely. And then I, I love the last point you made there about um, providing an opt out. <laughs> and I know from our past work together, like there was a lot of learning on on the marketing side from what is the difference between explicit and implicit. And I'm sure we're going to dive into that more. <laughs> we it's, will. It's, you know, so a bunch I, of legal I will leave. Loop. <laughs> exactly. I will leave number four there for the moment because we have a whole slide dedicated yeah. to it. But um, yeah. yes, you need to include an opt out for processing, especially when someone hasn't opted in, which is the example yeah. that I just gave. So we'll, we'll dive into more around that. But um, yeah, yeah. Cool. And then the final point I, I think I just want to make to the to the audience before we move on is that like the idea behind this is not to scrape a list and then just start sending them can template drip campaigns that they didn't Correct. opt into. Correct. But you're just you're just wasting time, and you're not going to get any results there. So I I know Daniel, you're going to break that down even further. So let's continue. Yep, you bet. So cool. um, so yes, for this section, you know, three main things, right? Use existing customer data to map your next desired customer, right? Ideal mm-hmm. customer profile. You hear more about this. I'll talk about a bowling pin strategy at the end there. Um, so okay. you know, more to come, but. Use that existing data, leverage new data sources, and I put in parentheses new. They've been around for a little while, but if you're not using intent right. data, if you're not looking at the website traffic that's hitting your your site, and you're not using that, you please do that today. You will uh, yeah. you will benefit significantly, um, and then use that information to collect people's contact information. Um, again, yep. there's some nuances in terms of what you do with that, which we'll get to mm-hmm. in a minute, but. Um, those are three points that uh, hopefully, you know, if you've, you've listened to this point, um, definitely, definitely take to heart. Fantastic. All right, let's keep the show on the road here. Yeah. Um, so staying compliant with privacy regulations, uh, I'm, I'm fascinated to, to learn about the history and the, the evolution of this. So yeah. let's dive in, man. Yeah, so look, um, you know, the, the thing that's interesting here is, you know, GDPR actually came into place in 2016, right? So everyone, I think, on this webinar probably remembers those privacy policy updates. Every company mm-hmm. sent them to you on, on May 24th. Um, why? Because no one was prepared, right? Uh-huh. <laughs> uh, and in fact, you know, Jaitano and I did a webinar um, in the early part of last year looking at who was prepared for the GDPR. No one was prepared. Um, Nobody. No yeah. one. 
So, you know, it, it went into effect uh, May of last year. We all remember that. But what's important to be aware of for folks that are in the U.S., California passed their regulation last year. Now, um, this happened, you know, midway point of last year. If you haven't heard of it, that's okay. Um, but it's going to be very similar to GDPR in terms of act providing the same type of provisions. So, if you know, you looked at GDPR, you're like, okay, well, we don't have European customers. That'll be fine. Um, you want to listen up for the next few slides because California, it's going to be exactly the same. There are mm -hmm. some nuances, but it's you know mm -hmm. same type of framework. Um, and it gives the same provisions to people in California. Now, um, does that mean that you need to treat people in Montana differently? Um, that's a decision you need to make as a company because that's probably not right. a great customer experience if you do so. But legally, yes, this only applies to Californian citizens. So only 39 million of the 330 odd in the US. Um, but, you know, fundamentally, there's, there's some changes coming. Um, those also continue mm -hmm. in India and Brazil. So they passed their regulation last year. And so next mm -hmm. year, we're going to see Brazil and California move forward with a regulation that looks very similar to the GDPR um, and allows some protection for people um, in terms of how their personal data is managed by by organizations. Right. Oh, fantastic. I'm, I'm dying to learn more about this. So why should we care? Yeah. So, you know, look, um, Everyone probably remembers with GDPR, there were fines, right? And there have been yeah, fines issued. Yeah. Google has received their first fine. There's been other penalties that uh, relate to just deleting your entire database. And so EU regulators have asked many small businesses to just delete their entire database. Um, those are wow. provisions that exist in the regulation that one can one can be asked to do at a business. Um, the kicker for California, and we'll go into this, but the fines actually translate to an individual. So let me just mm. reiterate that for a second in case you didn't catch on. Um, in Europe, it's 4% of global revenue. That's the maximum penalty. And that money goes mm -hmm. back to the regulator. Okay. Uh, in California, there are um, per incident fines. Um, and in the current framework, it's $750 per person. Um, but that can also be combined in class action lawsuits. And the payment goes back oh, wow. to the individual. So if you are upset with your, <laughs> you know, insert airline company or insert retailer email that you receive on January 2nd, you can personally file a claim um, to the Eternal Attorney General. There, uh, Those claims need to be operated via a telephone, which we'll get into in a minute. Uh, everyone must have a telephone that can accept this request. So um, wow. that's very different to GDPR and important to, to note. Um, the obvious ones right on the, the right-hand side there, revenue. Um, yeah. Clearly, if you haven't got your, your, your pieces together in terms of privacy, you're probably going to struggle in the sales process mm -hmm. if you're trying to sell your products or service. Cisco surveyed a number of firms there and found that to be the case no surprise. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, I mean, people are going to lose trust in your brand. That's uh that's an obvious one. That's the, that's the main one yep. aside from the hit that you take on the cash flow. <laughs> yeah. I um, mean, Facebook yeah, stock let's, let's, is probably a good example. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We saw, we saw it tank right after that, uh, horrific, uh, Mark Zuckerberg hearing. Exactly. Um, exactly. So, um, yeah. so what, what is California? I'll, I'll save you the, the, the majority of the legal document, which is 30 odd pages or so, and, uh, you know, sort of summarize it into these few bullet points here. Mm -hmm. um, they're pretty easy to read, uh, right? So we've, we've really tried to synthesize the entire document into a few bullet points. Um, if you're a consumer on this, in, on this line, you can see the right to know what personal information a business has collected. Okay, that seems pretty mm -hmm. logical, right? The right to delete mm -hmm. that information. Okay. Yep. Now, delete that information means across your business's data. So if you are collecting data and as, as a company and all of the third-party applications, and it's described as vendors for the CCPA, all the vendors you use, if you receive a deletion huh. request, you must federate those to all of the systems, the companies that you use. Wow. Um, wow, wow. So the right... So that's, that, that's got to be a major pain for companies, right? I mean, like some, as you know, many businesses use up to hundreds of... 
third party applications for their tech stacks to run. Yep. So, yep. so like th they have to manually do that. Is it automated? Like how does it work? Um, well, you know, uh, it's, it's <laughs> not automated. Um, there are services that yeah. help with that, but, um, mm -hmm. uh, one being data grail, but, uh, yeah, right. the, the key piece here is, um, you know, you can see, uh, this would be challenging for businesses. Uh, and mm -hmm. to be very clear, if we go onto the right hand side, um, you'll mm -hmm. see that it actually applies to, um, to, to really almost all businesses, right? So any business that's doing over 25 million in revenue. So think about your local Trader Joe's, your Safeway, um, yeah. small businesses down to, you know, if you have a, a chain of businesses that may be doing 25 million or more, that's going to apply to you. Um, and mm -hmm. this goes into effect January 1st, 2020, right? Um, mm -hmm. and so what's also important to note there, there's a look back period that goes back to January 1st, 2019. So what does oh, that mean? That wow. means that if on January 2nd, Jaytano says, look, um, you know, I've had it with insert airline company name. Um, and I, I'm not going to uh, name shame on the call, but you know, I've had it with yeah. this airline. Um, I want you to delete all my information that airline must go back and actually find all your information to January 1st of 2019 across all of their systems. So not, wow. not, not current data, prior data to January 1st, 2019. Wow. Incredible. Um, so I think it's poll time. Um, if everyone on the webinar wants to complete that poll. So on the bottom, of the screen, you should see a toolbar with a, uh, a phrase or, or action that says pull. And you should be able to um, complete that, that pull right about now. Um, and we wanna know <clears throat> on a scale of one to five, how prepared is your, your business for the Consumer California Privacy Act? If you'd go ahead right now and just uh, complete that poll. We're really curious to see who on the webinar is, is, is ready for that. Um, it's popping up right there. So we can start to look at some of the, uh, results as they come in. We'll give you guys about a minute here to go ahead and, uh, fill that out. Hey, I see a, a, a colleague and friend of mine on the webinar. Hey, Cesare, how you doing? Welcome. Thank you for joining. Um, all right. So it looks like most people are, all right. So there's no one that's very prepared. There's no one that's prepared at all. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we have, some people who are somewhat prepared, we have some people who are not prepared at all. And then there's just one lonely person that's uh, less than prepared. So um, yeah, I think this kind of confirms Daniel, what we, um, you know, what we kind of anticipated that, you know, pretty much no one was going to be very prepared or even number two prepared. Yeah. yeah. And look, um, you know, I think this is fine, right? We're we're nine months away, right? So, um, you know, there's there's certainly time to, uh, you know, work internally and figure out how you manage this type of process. Um, uh, and I think, you know, if we were to look at GDPR, if 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 you interacted with um, any of the teams that were were trying to go through that process last year. Um, my advice to you is, you know, don't leave it to the last minute. Um, there are a few recommendations right. that we have on the next slides that will sort of help um, in terms of what you want to think about and how you can approach it. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, I, I would encourage you to, you know, outside of legal counsel, try to figure out what you would need to do internally because uh, you will hear um, a lot of folks uh, in December trying to figure this out. Um, I would advise not to be one of those would be my, my two sets. Yeah. You don't want to be, you know, a straggler. Uh, that's going to be too late. Um, <clears throat> by the way, um, we have a question from Ted Reed. Um, maybe, maybe I can invite him onto the screen real quick and we can have a quick, like two or three minute dialogue here. Ted, yeah. uh, if you're cool with it, I'm going to invite you onto the screen. Let's see if we can get you up here. Um, if you can't join, that's all good. Um, but let's try. So I'm just going to, invite you up and uh let's see if we can get you in here so i think uh, you should see the request coming through cool let's see if he's able to join us 
just kind of impromptu get uh, someone from the audience up here. Let's see. Uh, he's connecting. Awesome. All right. He should be joining any second. Awesome. I'm very excited for this. It's going to be great to uh, have someone from the audience actually jump in here pretty impromptu and uh, engage with us for a little bit. So let's see if we can get him up here. Yeah. Impressive that Crowdcast puts this together. That's really cool. Oh, I love it. It's so good. All right, so it says accepted and connecting. Oh, so we're probably just waiting for internet bandwidth. bandwidth. Ah, there he is. Ah, there What's, he up, is? What's up, Ted? Uh, not much. I've got my, my camera for some reason is showing me sideways, but my, <laughs> that worked. I, I can still talk. My, the question is if you know California individuals request to be what information you've gathered yep. and then request you to delete – and you have purchased data from some of these data vendors, yep. they have to delete that information. So then the information you're actually purchasing is less valuable. Is that the that way is that's completely circling correct. Really correct? Yep. That's the way that circle will work. Okay. And in the yep. meantime, no, no, it's, it's, uh, 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 you know, it's, 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 it's if, if you're, you're in the data, data business, business, that's going to be a challenge, challenge uh, for, individuals for individuals that are in California, California. Uh, 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 which, which is, is why I would, uh, uh, if you're if engaging you're with those firms, firms definitely, definitely negotiate, negotiate appropriately, appropriately given what you just came, came to realize yourself, yourself that the value, the value is less for individuals, individuals in California. California. And every individual in California is going to start collecting seven hundred and fifty dollars come February fifteenth, multiple <laughs> times. Uh, I, would I would not encourage, encourage such, such behavior, behavior, but, but um, uh, they may intend. They may, intend, intend, <laughs> may do they that. Actually, they may do that. <laughs> yep. Okay, that was that was my question. I thought that was the way that would work if, as you explained it. So thank you. Yeah, yeah you, you bet. bet. Awesome. Great awesome. to have you with us, Ted. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Ted. Thanks, Ted. We're gonna uh, we're gonna um, go back to the webinar now. Cool. That was awesome. We that's had, really uh, cool. Our first person from the audience to join in and uh, ask a question and do some dialogue with us. By the way, for the audience, uh, we're gonna do Q and A at the end as well, so you'll have an opportunity to join us. Even if you want to just talk a little bit about your business, what you're doing, what you're up to, common challenges that you're facing. That's totally cool as well. It doesn't necessarily have to be a direct question about data privacy or how to grow your business with customer data. Um, but just a heads up, if you do want to join us, that's totally cool. Um, but we kindly ask that you um, use headphones if possible so that we don't get any sort of uh, echoing or feedback from the microphone. Uh, headphones would be the best way to prevent that from happening. So um, yeah, without uh, any further delay, let's get back to today's featured presentation. Let's go back to um, the webinar. We're about more than halfway through. We're almost there to the end. Um, and let's keep this show on the road. So Daniel, um, we saw that most people are not prepared. That's totally fine. That's about what we would expect. Um, let's talk a little bit about GDPR, the good, the bad, the ugly and the gray. Um, <laughs> what's the deal here, man? What's going on? So, uh, you know, I think it's probably worthwhile spending a little bit of time here. If you're working with customer data and you're trying to understand, um, you know, how, how you can use your customer data um, uh, and how you can contact individuals in Europe, right? So GDPR is now in place. Um, there is uh, a framework that describes legitimate interest um, and there is a framework that describes consent. Um, and so this is actually a little bit different than what's in California and there was a lot of discussion around this. Um, Jay Tyler, you and I had this of, you know, if you are contacting people in Europe and you've not got their explicit consent, meaning they mm -hmm. have not indicated they want to receive communications from you and explicitly indicated with a checkbox, you, you should probably not contact them. Now again, I'm not a lawyer. This is not legal advice. It will expose significant legal risk. Um, field marketing mm -hmm. team. So when you were doing events, right, you collect lists, as you talked about before, list buys from all the different places and you swap lists. That's probably not a good idea. 
Um, right. uh, there is risk there. Now, again, you can do it. It's just there is there is risk there. Um, if you do intend to contact those individuals, um, the one thing that I would advise is to include a disclosure statement. Um, mm -hmm. And we'll talk about what that means. Um, if you're trying to buy EU data, so contact data, so what Ted describes, you know, trying to get contact information for for potential users or, or, or of your product or consumers of your product. Um, Zoom Info and many other sources now don't sell contact data in Europe anymore at all. That stopped May of, wow. of last year. Um, now they they will sell it, so um, I'm sure I'll I'll receive a, a message from someone from Zoom today um, from saying that. Uh, but the risk associated is transferred to you as a business. So again, that's a risk based approach. So you can buy the data, but if someone is upset, um, you do agree to some of the risk associated with using that data. And I would be very careful yeah. when you make those legal decisions. Consult with your lawyer um, because there is. There are penalties that come with um, accepting that liability. Um, yep. Now, yeah, that's, that's risk mitigation right there. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. But there are some cool things you can do. So, um, you know, this is a really good example. Um, and so if you want to click to the next one, there's, a, there's an image that I'll show here. Um, now, this is basically a scenario where um, it's a company called Influ. Um, I'm actually overdue to meet with their CEO, so I'm giving him another free plug here. Um, but, uh, you know, basically how this works is they are targeting people on Facebook, targeting people on Twitter, targeting people on LinkedIn. This is actually Facebook. And you look at the first uh, sentence of that email. It's fascinating. As promised, I'm following up on your recent click in our person-based <laughs> advertising demo campaign. So what did they do? They... They got the information that I'd clicked on one of their display ads on Facebook. They then used that information, got my work email address, so emailed me at datagrail.io, and included in the first line, look, we got we got your information based on your click, and we're we're emailing you because you clicked on our stuff. We you clicked on our content. Yeah. Now that is completely the basis for legitimate interest because if they're if I would have asked them why are you contacting me. Well, I did click on their content, and I, I know I did. That's why I find this fascinating that they actually did that. Um, and so yeah, yeah. you could take this further if you wanted to and actually run campaigns, direct advertising campaigns on all of the peers of this individual. Yeah, so, the lookalikes and all that sort of stuff. Correct. Thing. So it's a yeah. very creative way of actually turning advertising into um, – uh, really person-based, which is actually what she's describing here, Kate. Um, it is missing a disclosure statement, though. So if I don't want to receive mm -hmm. information from Kate anymore, I have no way of uh, telling her I don't want this email or I don't want to be contacted. So it is missing that right. part, and we'll go into what that looks like in just a moment. Right. Now, for the audience listening, by the way, if you are getting a lot of these kinds of messages and you don't want to receive them, some things that I have tried is just simply responding with unsubscribe me ASAP and they'll, they'll usually do it. Yeah. Or you just flag it as junk and, you know, Outlook and Gmail and all these service providers now with, for email, email clients, they're able to detect all this stuff and uh, they're pretty good about flagging it as spam and just filtering it out of your inbox. So yep. that's always the second best option, but ideally you'd want to just go right to the source and say, no, opt me out. I do not want to receive these messages. Exactly. So, so I just mentioned disclosure statements, right? So um, without boring everyone with legalese related to the GDPR, um, if you uh, are emailing people uh, and you've got their information, so just like this example, right? So they at Influ had figured out that I'd clicked a Facebook ad. They then got my work email. Where they got that information from, I don't know because that's not connected to my uh, <laughs> Facebook. Um They've right. collected that somehow. And then maybe they searched it on LinkedIn. Fine. Yeah, great. Hopefully they did. Um, yeah. But So they got that work Hopefully. email, um, and they need to then give me the, the ability to say, hey, I don't, I don't want to receive an email from you anymore. Um, or they need to mm. be able to like show where they got that information from. Now, again, this is specific mm -hmm. for the EU, specifically for GDPR, specifically for when you're contacting people that um, have – not giving you consent um, for folks that have given you consent 
you need to be able to provide a preferences link there. So a link that allows right. one individual to decide what emails they want from you. Um, but if you're contacting people and you've not got their consent, you absolutely need a disclosure statement. So here's a good example on the right hand side. Um, now, uh, you know, uh, Michael here um, is a non-English speaker, so let's all not pick on his uh, his English. Um, he's he's based mm -hmm. in Poland, but this is a great example um, of a disclosure statement. So, P.S. More details about personal data processing and protection are available here. So. What's interesting is he's got there, I came across uh, the senior software engineering advertisement. So we are hiring senior software engineers. And so he found that advertisement. He's referencing why he's reaching mm -hmm. out to me. Um, so it's not just, I want to sell mm -hmm. my product. Mm -hmm. um, it's not based on any data yeah. though. So I didn't engage with him at all. I didn't give him any indication that I actually want his product or service, but um, he, he, he has looked at the advertisement and therefore is reaching out to me. And I'm sure everyone's received a recruiter email. Um, For but sure. He, he's indicated that he's actually found our job posting at least. So that's good. The key piece I want to highlight mm -hmm. is the second uh, red line there, the disclosure statement. That's a key piece that most teams doing sales, specifically outbound sales, often forget. So... Yeah, definitely. I don't think I've ever seen that. Yeah, uh, not many people include it. Um, you're definitely exposing yourself yeah. to risk when really it's just a, it's a mm -hmm. one line um, with a link, uh, and that'll reduce your your risk when contacting folks in the EU. Yeah, that's that's fantastic. Um, so yeah, key takeaways. Yep. So um, key takeaways here. You know, you want to create a very simple workflow for yourself. For these right to know, right to know, uh, say no, and deletion requests, right? So figure out how internally you're going to go about, um, to, to Jay Tana's point, contacting all of these vendors, right? If you've got 20 of them, figure out what you need to do to do that, document it, figure out where the data exists. Um, that's something you, you want to do. Um, you also need to, to understand, um, you know, where where the data exists um, and if it's coming in across the website, how are people able to opt out from your services? Um, and lastly, that disclosure statement, like Jay Chana said, you know, a lot of folks are not doing that, hasn't seen that before. Um, you're exposing yourself to risk by not doing it. And it's a very simple thing. Mm -hmm. You just add to the bottom of an email. Yeah, that's fantastic. And uh, it, it reminds me a lot of the forms that we had to adjust on the sales hacker website yep. um, to kind of get compliant with GDPR. Correct. We um, had to add that explicit checkbox consent with a link to the privacy policy in that text below the form exactly. um, so that users and, and, and website uh, visitors could be, you know, informed in a transparent way about what we intend to do with that data and that, you know, we're, we're going to keep their rights uh, when it comes to data privacy in mind and that we're not going to abuse their data. So yeah. Yep. Uh, awesome Spot stuff, on. man. Um, cool. So Sweet. last, last few slides here, this is some of the important yeah. stuff, right? Um, so, uh, you know, if, if you've, if you've heard of the bowling pin strategy, um, uh, definitely search it on Google. Um, you probably uh, heard of Jeffrey Moore's book, Crossing the Chasm. I'm going to reference it there. Oh, yeah. Um, if you haven't read that, please, please, please do yourself a favor and read it. It's one of the strongest books in business. Um, the bowling pin strategy is quite interesting. So how do you, you know, really make use of your, your customer data? How do you organize it? Um, when people are mm -hmm. selling products, um, and more so when people are buying products, it's highly likely that they'll buy products that um, uh, are connected in some shape or fashion. So I'll use a couple of examples here. So Yelp, um, as an example, use this approach whereby they focus their efforts exclusively on San Francisco um, and they didn't actually partner with any restaurants outside of San Francisco first. Why? Because the influential individuals within San Francisco then would communicate together and they would build a strong network effect of folks in San Francisco that would refer more customers, right? And so in the same way, this applies to the first slide that we went through of defining your ideal customer profile. 
in that if you find a particular vertical um, that, you know, is very, has, has a lot of problems um, and your product or service really solves that problem well, I would encourage you to sell uh, or at least communicate and try to try to have conversations with all of the people in that surrounding segment um, because they probably have the similar problem. Um, and so the concept here is, is um, uh, really focuses on the ICP and focuses on that first pin. You want a beachhead that ultimately then can get you all the customers that surround that beachhead. Um, so again, yeah. if you haven't read Crossing the Chasm, please do. Um, it's been around for a long time, but uh, it's, it's almost a Bible in terms of uh, defining your ideal customer profile. Absolutely. Um, all right, so we have this sort of old world model here. Um, yeah. So versus new world of personal data. Yep. So how, how does it all work? Yeah. So you know, if you think about um, ten years ago, right? If I'd said someone, you know, PII, or even three years ago, oh yeah, personally identifiable information. Great. An email address, a phone number. Okay. Yep. That make that makes sense. Ten years ago. Um, now, <laughs> um, there's an enormous amount of data that's collected about an individual, your, your purchase history. Um, so financial information, um, you know, all yeah. the, the individual things that I mentioned earlier that are tracking an individual on a website, tracking someone's mobile usage, tracking how they're yeah. using your, your product, um, tracking down to an IP address where you live and your location tracking um, yeah. cookies, so which sites you visit and which ones you don't and how much time, the session time on those sites. Um, so there's an enormous amount of individual when uh, data that can be combined to actually figure out exactly who you are. Um, and and that that's both an opportunity and just a, um, a reality that you need to be transparent with individuals of how you're collecting that data and also what you're doing with it. Um, and so, Absolutely. you know, we sort of bucket it into three areas. There's a personal profile of an individual. There's activity data, location data, and financial. But those are the three main buckets mm -hmm. that sort of everything falls under in this new world of personal data. Yeah. Um, and then uh, this is a problem that I've faced. I, I faced it in the past. I face it today. Um, the average Fortune 500 runs on 100 plus marketing systems and you know, the evolution of this has simply exploded. I mean, I don't, I don't know any companies that are running on 7,000 systems, but I mean, I'm sure it's, it's possible. Yeah. I mean, look, um, you know, this is a uh, Scott Brinker from chief marketer. He has a, a huge, uh, image, right. And so we transpose that image yeah. into this graph just to visually sort of, uh, describe what it's looking like, you know, in 2011, 2012, um, there are a small number of marketing systems that you could buy off the shelf, right? You could go search for, yep. um, let's say, someone doing that form that Jay Tano described earlier. And there are about five companies mm -hmm. that were selling form products, right? There are content management systems for managing the content on your website. There are about five of those. Now there's about 50 of them, right? Um, and so that yep. growth in yep. marketing systems has allowed people to just, you know, go buy more systems. Um, and there's more data across those systems. And so, um, you know, really just something to think about here as your organization, if you're in the Fortune 500, you probably got a lot of systems. If you're aspiring to get there, expect that the number of systems your IT department will be managing or working with will only increase, right? So you're not, you're not going to see consolidation where marketing, the number of systems the marketing team is going to decrease. It's only going to increase as you get bigger. Um, so, yeah. 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 And, and shameless plug here. I mean, this is a, this is why Nextiva is trying to solve a lot of these problems that businesses are facing with the disparate systems that don't necessarily integrate well with, with one another. We have, uh, we've developed a, a, a software suite called next OS where we have sales and marketing capability under one umbrella unit. Um, so for example, you know, we have our own sales and customer service oriented CRM, uh, similar to how like a Zendesk would have a ticketing system and then similar to how maybe a pipe drive would have a sales pipeline component to the CRM. And then we couple that in with voice 
business text messaging, surveying capabilities. So no, no different than something like a survey monkey would do. Um, email marketing and marketing automation, very basic system, easy to use, all under one umbrella system. All the data is under one place. There's an analytics and Power BI um, component to that as well. But the point is not necessarily to plug in all those products at this point in the webinar, mm -hmm. but it's just a point to say that, you know, as you're, let's say you're a startup and you need marketing automation or you need email marketing, you're probably going to look for a, a system that does that. And you might go to a MailChimp or an active campaign, and then you need a CRM. Um, and you might go to a HubSpot or a pipe drive or something like that. And then you need the next thing. You need the next thing. And before you know it, you've got a gnarly looking tech stack. It's hard to maintain. There's all Correct. these different components that have to pass data to one single source of truth. And I can tell you based on firsthand experience that there are systems and, and automation tools such as Zapier that can pass data along from one to the next. But what ends up happening sometimes is that the, the Zapier um, automation plugin uh, could break. And it can be something as simple as like, let's say the credit card on the Zapier billing system expired. And then your, your, your Zapier automations break. And then you don't realize this has been happening until like three days later. And there's been people signing up for your content and your email list and your webinars and filling out forms on your website. And it's not getting passed through to Salesforce or whatever. And then you realize, you know, oh my gosh, we've been losing out on data, on leads, on money. And it's all because of a credit card expiration on a, mm. on a plug-in tool that didn't go through. So that, like that happened to us. So I'm just using that as one example, but yeah, I guess that kind of drives the point home. Yep. It definitely does. You're going <laughs> to use a lot of systems. Um, you got to make them work. Yep. So yep. you know, something I think that people overlook and look, Jay Tana, you and I worked through this together. Um, there are, and you just described some of it there as well. Um, if you think if you're a consumer company, so if you if you've got consumers as customers, so people that buy your products are consumers, you're going to have about three, four, five systems that email someone. You're going to have mm -hmm. uh, a promotional emailer, so you're going to have something that sends out promotions about your product or service. Um, you're probably going to have some form of account system, right? So yep. logging into your account at XYZ company. You don't want your promotional mm -hmm. email or sending that transactional email. You want a different email for that. So you use a different email vendor. That might be SendGrid, Mailgun, Mandrill. There's a whole bunch of them. Um, yeah. And then, you know, if you've got consumers, you probably want to send them surveys about how their experience was, right? Um, that's that's very natural. Um, so that's another system. Yep. That might be SurveyMonkey. That might be Medallia. That might be, um, you know, Qualtrics. So now you've got three systems just with, you know, bare bones. Um, and then you've got, you know, other things that may send um, e email. So what you want to do is make sure that um, if you are sending emails through many systems, that there is a central place that someone can arrive and say, I don't want your promotional email, but I do want to make sure if I have to change my password that I still get my email, right? That's a, that's a right. transactional email. You don't want to lose those. Um, or I don't want your surveys mm -hmm. and I don't want your promotional emails, but I do want to be able to have my account operational. Um, and so that's, exactly. that's important. Exactly. Um, and it's something that's often overlooked as businesses expand with these systems. They add more systems that communicate, forget that actually someone can update their preferences. Yeah. And the point is like, you know, think about all these systems that are hitting your customers or your prospects. I mean, they could be receiving up to four, five, six emails or communication mediums from you uh, per week. Yep. So on top of like all the other noise that you know your prospects and customers are probably getting, other email newsletters and marketing newsletters and salespeople trying to sell them stuff, like the noise just builds up and builds up and it becomes unbearable to a point. So the way that you'll be able to keep um, prospects and customers in your database and not piss them off is by giving them this preference management yeah. system where they can pick and choose. All right. I don't want this, but I, but I do want this. Correct. And if you don't have this, what ends up happening is they just unsubscribe everything and then you lost them. Correct. So correct. Yeah. Save yourself a lot of money and uh, 
heartache yep. by yep. Im- implementing a preference management system. I would highly recommend you do that. So, um, yeah, I guess the final key takeaways right here, Daniel. Yeah. Take it down. Yeah. So look, um, one personal data extends beyond an email and a phone number, right? These are right. our traditional PII. Yes. Personally identifiable information. There's a lot more things that now you can use and you can leverage about an individual. Um, that's great. You've got to also think about how you can, um, you know, keep track of that and keep, as you add systems, make sure that you know where that data is going between those systems, right? So understand the data flows of, we get, you know, something from an e-commerce vendor, we send them an email and then they have a survey afterwards, right? Where does that data all go? Um, and so ultimately that leads to preference control. So you need to be able to do that as well. Um, and that's what we just touched on now. So there's, you know, one, you've got a lot more data. That's great. Um, you can leverage it and you should, uh, for people that, you know, you've, you've collected their information, you should do that. Um, and so final kind of takeaways here. Um, you know, I, uh, I, I, I think the ideal customer profile, um, and I think hopefully folks, folks on the line have, have come to this conclusion on their own, the value remains, right? Um, Yep. However, now we've got new information. So, um, you know, information that helps us with firmographics, also information that helps us with who's coming to our website and potentially who's interested in our product or service. You definitely want to use that if you can. Um, and then, you know, there's tactical steps that you just need to adjust to provide that transparency that Jaytana described. If you are or do have customers uh, or, or future customers in Europe or in California, which is probably everyone on this line. Um, yeah. And then, you know, just make sure you have an understanding of where all your data lives. Um, and I know that obviously that that's easy for me to say, um, you know, that is an area that we help with businesses. And so, you know, if these, these areas sound challenging, um, happy to help, um, you know, obviously here is a resource, but, um, you know, if you want to get a hold of me, three channels there, Twitter, LinkedIn and email. You're wondering why Gaijin Dan? Um, I always share that as a funny note. I spent a couple years in Japan. Gaijin is foreign uh, person in Japanese. Um, I'm generally a foreign person everywhere I go, so it just seems appropriate. Awesome, man. That that's super cool. Um, so Daniel, this has been fantastic. By the way, if anybody wants to connect with Daniel, um, you can. Um, you know, hit him up on any of those mediums that he just mentioned, or you can just click that connect with Daniel button um, at the bottom of the screen and it'll take you right to his LinkedIn profile, which I think is super cool. Um, And at this point in the webinar, I think what we want to do is just invite maybe one or two people up uh, to join the screen with us and ask some questions, maybe talk about their business, a, a challenge that they may be facing with regard to data privacy, customer data, any of the things we talked about today, or just anything at all whether it comes to, you know, technology, sales, marketing, customer experience, anything of that nature. Um, if you want to come on up, just uh, why don't you go ahead and chat, um, enter your name into the chat bar on the side there, and uh, we'll call you up for some Q&A and some, some dialogue. If you're, if you're interested in doing that, we'll open up the floor right now for the next five minutes or so, and uh, we'll, we'll make that happen if anyone's interested. So, Let's see who we've got left live on the webinar. We've got uh, Trisha, Jeremy, Carol, Brian, Abby, Julian. What's up? Uh, Rich Suter, Connor Sheedy. Ted, you're still with us. That's awesome, man. JG, uh, Sadna, how you doing? And Atul. Um, If anyone wants to come on up and discuss anything, now is the time. Uh, We'll give you about another 30 seconds or so. Uh, to be a brave soul and uh, request that we call you on up. If not, um, make sure you connect with Daniel. Click that call to action button below the screen. Connect with him. Ah, we've got one brave soul. We got one taker, Rich. So um, he said, interesting discussion. Thanks for doing this. Um, Thank you, Rich. We're going to call you on up to join the screen uh, and have just a quick dialogue with us before we sign off. It looks like you're the only brave soul here that uh, wants to come on up. So we'll give you a quick call and see if you can hop on for a second. So I just invited you. You should see the screen prompt here to to bring you into the discussion. And uh, let's see if we can get you up here. It looks like uh, 
should be requesting you now. Let's give it a second here. Let's give him a second. Let's see if we can get him in. Uh, looks like he rejected because maybe he couldn't uh, get anything set up properly with his audio. He says he's got to go. No doubt, Rich. We appreciate you, man. Um, for anyone that wants to connect with me, of course, I'm going to leave my uh, direct email um, in the chat. Gaetano at Nextiva.com. You can check out Nextiva.com for more information about anything that it is that we do. Uh, once again, Daniel, thank you so much. This has been a phenomenal webinar for anyone that had to hop off uh, you'll get the recording you'll get the deck you'll get it all so daniel thanks again for being with us man and i hope everyone really enjoyed this uh session you bet. It's great to that's be here. it for today and uh trisha thank you so much we appreciate it um and have a great day thank you so much everyone peace out later